All right. Good morning out there. Welcome to May 15th. It's a sunny Saturday, which is like the complete opposite for this channel because usually it's a rainy uh, day, rainy Sunday specifically, whenever we talk about comics and stuff, right? But today we have a beautiful day and I was going to shoot another video, but I decided to do a live show because we are going to go out and enjoy this day today, right? So I have a ton of stuff and we're going to do the live show for uh, Cavern of Chaos. We end up uh, talking about the books we bought or accumulated and stuff on there. So sometimes I lose track of what I need to show for the proper video hauls and stuff. So maybe I can get that stream of consciousness and reminisce about some of this stuff or think about stories from it and everything. So I've got a really great haul. And a majority of this is from eBay because last month uh, I've whined about it enough. Uh, hey, what's up, Scott? I whined about it enough here where um, I was sick for a week. And apparently when I am laid out on the couch, the last thing I need to be doing is being on my phone with that eBay app playing around and stuff. Because it turns out there was actually one or two packages I ordered and had zero memory. The uh, I was so out of it with the bronchitis and all that stuff, right? But as I looked up, it was good stuff, and the prices are great. So one of the things that I ended up ordering uh, right off the bat, which I don't think I've shown in a haul video, is it turns out this this kind of cracked me up. It turns out that if you when a book actually comes out and you play around on eBay, there are comic book stores that will be offering the book maybe a little bit of a pre order or the day it comes out. And uh, you get it for cover price and a little bit of shipping and stuff, which cracked me up. So when I found this one comic book shop on eBay, uh, it turns out it's out of uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, which is right outside of Pigeon Forge um, or right in, you know, yeah, right there. So it's right where Sevierville turns into Pigeon Forge, if you will, uh, down there at Gatlinburg, in Tennessee. And I laughed because I've been there. I was like, oh, how funny. But apparently I got the number one of the Geiger, you know, the uh, Jeff Johns, Gary Frank book. And on the Cavern of Chaos with those guys, uh, Jared Osborne, you know, he's he's reading it. I think number two is out now. But, you know, I got this last month. I got this about two days after it came out. I cannot complain about the shipping and how they got it to me and everything. So it's post-apocalyptic, much like uh, it seems like post-apocalyptic books. seem to, There seems to be like there's a ton out there. But that's going to lead into my next book, The King of Post-Apocalyptic uh, Comic Books in in my opinion. Um, of course, if you are a Kirby nut, you already know what I want to talk about, what I'm going to show. And it's interesting because uh, this, this book came about because uh, Marvel back in the seventies ended up getting the license to do the planet of the apes books. Carmine Infantino, who was the publisher or whatever the title was back there, decided he wanted a book to kind of compete with that. And Kirby ended up digging to uh, two, two stories that he had already done, I think, in the late 50s. Uh, one was sort of a short story, and I think it was called Amazing Stories Number 1 or something like that. I can look it up later, um, where you had talking animals and things like that. And then he had a strip, a, com a strip, that newspaper strip he was trying to get take off that was sort of called Commandy, and he kind of brought those in. And uh, he ended up getting Commandy, his one truly successful book in my opinion and other people's opinion for DC. Um, and I have all the Kirby stuff. I have the whole series except for like maybe five issues and I'm not really into really trying to track those down. I, I don't have that burning need to have a complete set, which I should. Uh, but anyway, um, in, in the commanding book, is really interesting because in the 90s, uh, in comic book shops and things like that, even with the crowd that I was around, uh, you know, you had a few people that loved Kirby, but if you talked about Commandy, I mean, it's like you were on a whole level of geekdom, okay? Being eclectic like that, you sort of got the weird looks from the other collectors. That was a long time ago. Even Toy Fair. Toy Fair was a magazine that Wizard Magazine branched out of their Wizard books. Uh, they had a... Uh, article sort of a section of the toy fair magazine where they would take me mego mego characters figures and stuff of thor and iron man and he-man action figures would pop up and they would make little strips and little stories and then they came out with collected editions of those 
Oh God, it was something theater, Toy Fair Theater. I don't know what it was called. Somebody out there might know what it was. But anyway, I remember seeing one where the, the action figures were actually at a comic book convention and they had Thor trying to get his Commandy collection up and they made fun of him. And I was like, that's exactly what it was like being a Commandy fan. Now uh, I woke up uh, 6.30 this morning. I was playing around with um, Facebook and I think Jack Kirby Art. I don't know, part of a Jack Kirby group. They uh, they shared a Forbes article, Forbes magazine article about Commandy, the cartoon. Apparently, a DVD has been released by uh, DC Comics, one of their animated features, and it's the Justice Society during World War II. So I'll end up getting it. But actually, and it turns out that the short that they put on those, they they pack these DVDs full of little shorts and stuff like that. Twisted Mego Theater. That is it. That is it. But it turns out that they have a Jack Kirby animated short on there that apparently is gaining some attention enough to where Forbes decided to do a, I want to give them a B plus on the article uh, about Commandy. There was a few things where I cringe, but it was, a, you know, but if I wasn't such a big fan of Commandy and stuff, it's, it's a fine article and stuff, right? Uh, you know, picking at it. But it really does always bother me when I'm like going to work and I have Kid Craddock on the radio or, um, and, and they end up talking about Marvel movies and they try to talk about comic books and comic book characters. I really wish I had a way of doing a compilation video of them trying to talk about comic books and superheroes and stuff. It's the worst thing. It actually makes me want to pull over and get on Twitter and tweet at them while they're on the show, whatever they're doing. They're like, please stop, please stop. You know, <laughs> like it's, you know, it's real painful. So the Forbes article is actually pretty good. And any kind of attention that Commandy gets is always good. Uh, I like how the characters actually become more popular, in my opinion, in the last 10 or 11 years uh, than he ever has. That's, you know, probably since the 70s or the people that loved Kirby back then. So a couple years ago, I went to Ollie's and for like something like seven or eight bucks, I'm sure I ended up getting volume two of the complete Jack Kirby Commandy. This is issues 20 through 40. Kirby did uh, wrote and drew probably the first, I don't know, 36 issues, 37 issues. And then he hung around and did the art. And I think Jerry Conway came in and uh, started writing the book a little bit. And Kirby was transitioning out. So 40 issues proper. So I went ahead and I got on eBay. And this is the amazing thing. A lot of the things I'm going to show was this great feature on eBay where I um, I just had to, I finally got sick of looking at my shelf and, and was missing the volume one. So I ended up getting volume one of the Commandy uh, Jack Kirby collection. This is one through 20. So this one's 21 through 40, one through 20. Yeah. So, but what was wild is that, like, I didn't really want to pull the trigger on this. Um, you know, it's got just like a little crease here in the dust cover, which doesn't really even, well, there it is. You can kind of see it. Not a big deal, but um, I figured it should have a bigger discount than what it was. So some of these books I left in my uh, watch, you know, watch list. And all of a sudden I started getting emails. Now, I know this has been around, but I've never seen it used so much. And all of a sudden I was starting to get emails talking about a uh, seller has offered you a bigger discount and stuff. Right. And I've sort of and it's been odd numbers, 28 percent. I saw one was 8%. So I got this for a huge discount and I cannot complain that when it came in, this is my favorite format of reading Commandy. I don't have to dig through the boxes and gingerly open the bags if I feel like reading them because the paper has sort of a newsprint feel to it. All right. It's a little bit stronger and stuff. And this is just, the, this is the way to read Commandy in my opinion. This is fantastic. It, has a, it feels like a news strip. And it's fun, three chapters, full of all great stuff. Um, and then the book itself is just fantastic. I love it. Got those dots in there. The binding is great. Thing opens flat. It's fantastic. So as you can see, I've been reading through there, starting from the beginning again. And uh, you can see where I was reading the other one. Got about halfway through and decided to wait to get the first one. Um it just amazes me that no matter how many times I've read all these Jack, these Commandy Kirby's, uh, I always find a little bit something new or something I sort of forgot. And every issue of Commandy can be its own movie. It's just amazing. We'll put that to the side.
Okay. All right. So another thing that I got off eBay, and again, I bought this because I got a discount from the seller. This is this actually books for eighty dollars, um, and it's sort of a sequel, if you will, to The Killing Joke by Alan Moore. Came out around 1990. There's actually two issues, but this is the big boy. This is actually worth more than the first issue, despite the Suicide Squad having a movie and everybody went nuts over that number one a couple years ago. But I uh, ended up getting uh, Suicide Squad number 48, um, which is just an amazing book. I've been to many flea markets. I actually found an entire run of Suicide Squad that was 60. For some reason, the guy decided to charge 65 cents a piece. It was in a clear bin. Uh, all these books were just stacked in there neatly, but uh, I would go through them and uh, always you'd have issue number one, 48 and 49 out of there. But I would, uh, but I would be able to pick up the other key book in Suicide Squad. I think it's number 23, which is the first appearance of Oracle, who used to be Batgirl. That was a big deal back in the day, but it really blows my mind that people still seek this book out, at least on eBay. They still seek them out whenever I'm at a con, if Suicide Squad comes up. The only time I really noticed is, like I said, when the movie was out. So uh, I found this and got a fantastic deal. I got it for a fraction of its value. And I have to say, despite just a touch of discoloring in the coloring in the, in the box from age, which, like I said, it's so faint, it doesn't really show up. Uh, this is pretty much a mint copy, you know, um, usually with eBay, I end up having like nightmare stories about packaging or, you know, it's eBay uh, a handful of times. Uh, it was nice to have uh, something come through the mail that they were able to get it right. You know, so there we go. We have that a little bit of a key book. I'm just kind of going through here. Uh, I'm saving that for last, I think. The other thing I've got here is uh, suicide, more suicide squad. We stopped at an Ollie's. We... Was it last weekend? Maybe it was last weekend, the weekend before, but uh, we traveled to go do some hiking. I have the pictures on Instagram where we're actually on top of a mountain. Uh, the, the hiking was not that bad, um, so I don't want to like make it sound like we, we conquered a mountain there. But uh, it was much better than the last hike we did last year, where it ended up being six miles, three miles completely uphill. You know, so we didn't know what we were in for on that one. So this one was pretty good. But anyway, we ended up riding around, found a place to eat, hit some back roads. And on the way back, I decided to hit an Ollie's in a town called Pulaski. Scott Connor out there knows what's going on. Got Victor Thomas showing up. Nice. Good morning. I'm surprised people were home on such a beautiful day. Like I said, we're getting out of here. Oh, oh, here we go. Here's a blast from the past. Infrared Media. Nice to see you, brother. Good to see you. Been a while. I think you've uh, started putting out a video or two, I think, there uh, again. So anyway, we stopped in Pulaski on the way back. Uh, I ran in and I went through the trades. There's another one here I'll pull out in a minute, probably. But anyway, um, what was so weird is I was just looking these up on eBay while I was looking at that last Suicide Squad book. And I would see the trades, and some of these are selling for crazy money, which I'm not sure why. It's you know, um, Sometimes I'm not so much surprised that something is in demand, that some odd book is selling. It's always I want to know how and why. Who's, how, that, that's, uh, it's the why. I want to know why. What happened? How did everybody jump on this and stuff, right? But some of the later issues of the Suicide Squad trades – sounded like for 20 bucks and up while I was doing this. I'll have to go back and look at my Instagram page because I did put them on there. I usually put my books on Instagram uh, when I get them to talk about them. But I want to say these were either three ninety. I think these were three ninety nine dollars a piece. I might be off by a dollar or something. But I think these were three ninety nine. dollars Of course, they're not in order. And they're in order, but they're, I took them off the shelves and stuff, right? But uh I had these back in the day. I, I had Suicide Squad number one. I hung around about the first 14 issues and uh, it just sort of dis started disappearing from the newsstands in town. I don't know what it was. And, I, and I'm not shy to say that, um, you know, I feel like this series would have been a bigger hit in the 80s. I mean, they had a lot of momentum. This came out out of the Legends miniseries. Uh, the new DC Universe was finally starting up proper after um, Crisis. These guys came out of, you know, there was a, these guys came out of the same book that brought out the 
Justice League by Keith Giffen, the Mantis, you know, legends and stuff. We had Superman being rebooted a year before that. We had George Perez on Wonder Woman. We had Batman Year One, and they just sort of uh, were. We were coming out of the of uh, Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen finally, you know, completing up. And Suicide Squad was right in the mix of this. If they had had a better artist, I think the, it would have took off better. But I mean, it had all the elements. So now reading these and flipping through these after all these years, um, you know, I got to say John Ostrander had a plan and a great structure for the book and it flows. I mean, it almost feels like this is one 60 issue story or something uh, just from what I was flipping through. They introduced Batman. Batman ends up messing with him. Here's the second part of the killing joke sequel, I guess. Uh, here's one where they go to Apocalypse. Uh, issue five, the thing he brought in Kirby, Dark Side, Batman, um, uh, all sorts of things, villains. So it was good stuff to get those for so cheap. Brought in a little Ditko character. I mean, it had Ditko and Kirby characters in it, obscure characters, Charlton hero characters. So, uh, if you were like a DC guy, they, they were picking characters that, uh, they can mess with, you know, that's how you get character development. You get a bunch of B and C uh, level characters and you can go to town on them. You know, that's how it felt. All right. So something else I got off eBay and I was very glad to get this because this actually took a month. I got these for three fifty as well. Okay. So again, going back to the nineties, it seems like this is a day where I'm remembering when we finally got a comic book shop in our town that was called Moonlight Comics or something like that. And it was only around for a year, but it was fantastic. It was in a mall. Uh, a lot of people I went to high school with hadn't seen since high school in three or four years, we would end up meeting there and seeing each other and talking comics. And one of the books, there was, there was a little bit of a buzz. This is probably like 93 or 94. There's still a buzz going on. People were, the buzz was for Jeff Smith's bone. Hillboy was getting a big buzz. Uh, you know, a lot of this dark horse stuff was getting a buzz. Of course, everybody was like crazy. Vertigo was taken off. But one of the books that I was hearing in the same terms as the people who were talking about bone in the shop was mage. And at the time there was 15 issues that came out in the eighties through Kamiko comics. Right. So I'd heard about mage before I'd actually seen it. Now I saw mage I mean, uh, I saw mage, in advertisements for like amazing heroes or whatever uh, magazines I could pick up about comics and doing articles and stuff. Right. So uh, apparently there was a big renaissance in the late nineties for mage where Matt Wagner was doing the second arc of a trilogy in the eight. Apparently these are sort of uh, meta autobiographical a little bit. Um, I'm still trying to figure out that. I don't know if he's talking about his era of life that he's in or what's going on, but I'm assuming Matt Wagner's drawn himself as uh, Kevin Matchstick here, right? Who is the pin dragon and Excalibur is basically a bat and the mage back there is actually Merlin. And then all these other characters of myth comes up. And what Matt Wagner does is that he'll take a character of myth and he'll kind of mix it with, um, a comic book superstar like he has a hercules character uh whose name is kirby hero you follow me okay but anyway uh to kick things off um the ones i wanted i don't know what all they did but they came out with these reprints of the kamiko series and in each issue of these square bound books is two issues of the original series, which is fantastic. I think the coloring was in there. What I find interesting is that the first arc is called the hero discovered. And I think this is the book that Matt Wagner, I want to say pulls from Shakespeare. Every title of every story is, is a quote from a Shakespeare play or something. Right. But in the first issue here, book one, they have it as book nine, and they had the title correct on the front of the book, but on the side, they have it as the, the hero defined, which is the second arc. So right off the bat, the very first, I have one and two in there already. This is a set that I bought. Um, but yeah, right off the bat, they sort of messed it up. I don't know. I'd love to know the story behind that. But anyway, there's other characters that pop up where this is the world building and uh, it's, got, it's got a definite charm to it. It's, it may just definitely have a charm. I totally get why people were reminiscent of it. In the midst of uh, what was going on in the 80s, uh, you sort of have Mage over here, kind of Matt Wagner doing his own thing here. But these are 
really good. And I'm working my way through the first trilogy proper, sitting down and reading it all the way through. I haven't read all 15 issues, you know, just bits and pieces. I have one Kamiko issue in there. And then, so while the Mage Mania was going on with Matt Wagner, I guess at this time, he was coming out with the second trilogy also in a monthly book, all 15. Uh, I got these for $3 and 50 cents. I also got the second mage for, I think, $3.50, the actual proper issues, The Hero Discovered. And about five, I think it was like about five years ago now, something like that, he did um, the last arc of this, the last 15. So it's three arcs, 80s, 90s, 2000s, teens, and it completes the story, I guess, of mage. Great books. Uh, I'm on issue seven, as you can see. Put that here. So this is actually very good, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to be reading these and I got to tell you, they're, they're excellent. They're really good. This has uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you they're, they're fighting creatures of myth, if you will, that pop up trolls and things like that. Uh, harpies that they find. And where this is an on the road sort of book with his buddy, I was like, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if Eric Kripke from supernatural red mage, cause it, it has a little bit of a supernatural feel to it. There we go. Kirby Hero there. Yeah, I hope they didn't spoil that story. And uh, at the end of every 15th it issue, you get a special, apparently, uh, big book uh, with a fancy cover. So, oversized, finishing out the arc and the story. And uh, it's a high, you know. There we go. But uh, I became a Matt Wagner fan a whole lot because of his Batman Grendel uh, crossover books in the 90s. It was two two-issue miniseries that was put out through Dark Horse and uh, DC. And I think Matt Wagner did them both, and they were just fantastic. Okay, put those to the side. So, yeah, Mage. So now I'm out to get the third arc of Mage. Finish that all up. And we got here. Gotta love Ollie's, you know it. And got them for tree fifty. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's a fantastic price for the tree fifty. So, uh, God, where did I get these? I think I got these at uh, an antique shop. I'm um, one of oh, I know some of these are at a comic book shop too. Anyway, these were all a dollar mixed around. And I really got to watch myself talking about where I got these. I think there's still some things I didn't grab. But I'll go through these pretty quick because uh, I'm saving the big book for last here. But I got all these for like a, a, a buck a piece, but I still got a little bit of a deal. You know, it's one of those things the more you bought. This is the second print of David Max Kabuki from the 90s. Um, I think this is from uh, Caliber Comics and uh, I'm pretty sure this won an award. And David Mack has talked about a lot. And there are people uh, who still talk about Circle of Blood. Uh I'm not going to say they're over enthusiastic when it does come up, but there is a fondness for it. I, I have a feeling it's more about the artwork. Um, I can finally sit down and read my three issues of uh, Miracle Man uh, Apocrypha. 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 Here we go. There's always that one book and one word. But anyway, this is number two of a three issue miniseries from Eclipse. Uh, I want to say it's 1990. And this has Neil Gaiman, Mark Buckingham, Kurt Busiek. Uh, Paul Smith, uh, Alex Ross in here, all when these guys were sort of rising, uh, some right before they became famous, some while they were getting famous. Uh, and there was three issues of this. It's just sort of a anthology story, a few little short stories of Miracle Man with a setting, a framing, if you will, that kind of puts them all together. Uh, these are fantastic. I really, really dig those. Uh, so glad to get that second issue. If you watch Cavern of Chaos, you're going to find out that I'm the last man in the world to know about Mr. X, apparently. <laughs> Even though I, by complete by complete accident, after we start talking about Mr. X, I found his first appearance. But uh, I have some random Mr. X books. Mr. X, uh, to me, the big thing is, is that I've watched movies that this book um, has influenced. Uh, you know, very much uh, finished up my Roger Corman uh, miniseries, uh, Roger Corbin miniseries of uh, Banner that he did uh, right when Joe Casada took over as editor chief in Marvel 20 years ago. 
give or take. And he started bringing in indie guys to uh, work on books and slowly started abandoning uh, continuity and things like that. But Corbin on the Hulk, when that happened, I was so in, blew my mind. If you're the last, I'm the second, the last. Not sure how it eluded me for so long. I have the same question. I ran across Mr. I know you're talking about Mr. X, correct? Uh, but I'm the same way. I would see Mr. X like in dollar bins here and there. Uh, never really ran across anybody that was crazy for Mr. X, but it seems like everybody is real familiar with it. So after being on the Cavern of Chaos, having some people talk about Mr. X, some people in the comments, I picked up a trade off of eBay or maybe a few issues. And I was like, damn it, this is actually good. You know, I was like, so, I mean, it's actually a really good book. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought, Mr. X. So yeah, Mr. X. Um, I'm I'm not saying I'm hooked, but I'm like, I, but it's 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 well done. It's very well done. I mean, there is an atmosphere uh, when you read the book. You are in that city. The premise apparently is Mr. X designed a city through architecture. He designed the buildings in the city, and it was uh, supposed to be a psychological effect to calm people down to make them feel mentally well and emotionally well. And it did the opposite. People are actually doing are crazy, doing crazy things, uh, and they don't. They're, they're completely oblivious. They have no idea that the, the city that they're living in has been designed to do that to them. You know what I'm saying? Here we go again, being blank. I've got this. This is what I get for having it on uh, VHS. I'm gonna have to get it on DVD. But in the '90s, there was a book that came out, a book, a movie that came out with. Uh, I think it was Kiefer Sutherland. And uh, there was a, a bunch of uh, people who dressed in black hats, had completely white skin, no hair, and black trench coats, and they controlled the city. They could move the buildings and everything. Yeah. Frank Lloyd Wong. There we go. Nice. But something I do know about is uh, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. If I really had to buckle down and say what my favorite movie is, it would probably be Blade Runner uh, because that is the movie I can watch over and over and over. Uh, I saw it in the theater when I was nine years old, uh, completely fell in love with it. I love the noir feel of the theater cut that you find out everybody that made the movie hated. I like all the cuts of the movie. I like how Ridley Scott's stuff all ties together with his other movies. But uh, boom, I think they won some awards for this, came out with a series of books where they actually went back to the source material, the Philip K. Dick book. And they are doing this adapt adaptation where they go directly by the book. They use every word that's in the book and they uh, are drawing it out in comic book form. And this went on for a while. So I'll pick these up whenever I can. Um, I was real skeptical about when they came out. So I figured I would wait, and it turns out I enjoy it. A lot of people find it hard to read, and I totally get that because you're reading a novelization done in comic book form. It's going to be wordy and have weird pacing, and it's going to be different. Uh, it's going to be different in structure from what you're used to in a comic book if they're going to be faithful, you know. So I think I think this was a book picked up more by Philip K. Dick fans more than comic book fans, and probably fans of Blade Runner, you know. Terminal City. Terminal City is a book that uh, the same person who did Mr. X did. Uh, like I said, I've been delving into the history of this stuff, and all this Mr. X stuff has been right in my face. You know what I mean? That's what gets me. It's been right there in my face, and I just looked over that. Terminal City, I think, is the Vertigo comic that the same person who did Mr. X did did. Dark City was the movie. Thank you, Victor Thomas. This is why I love doing live shows. This is are you okay, babe? Okay. Okay. Uh, but this is why I love doing the YouTube. This is why I love the people that pop up and watch this stuff. And this is why I love the comment section, man. We all do the work together. It was Dark City. Yes, that's the movie that kind of makes me feel like it could have been a Mr. X movie. You know, if they had changed a few things around. But I have not read a lot of Doctor uh, Mr. X, so I'm not the guy, go to guy on that one, you know. Uh, some other dollar books is Grim Jack, uh, Tim Truman fan here in all these books. Um, I mean, I know the back market, uh, back issue comic book scene is on fire now and stuff, but, um, you know, I could go, I, I, I could go on and on about the last five years being less than inspiring with a lot of comics, which is plays a big part in why I don't do a lot of 
videos uh, talking about uh, current books and things and getting all juiced up by them, but uh, rediscovering these 80s books that were not, I could not read back in the day because I had to spin a rack. I was a kid. Uh, no comic book shop and stuff, but rediscovering this stuff and having people talk about these books over the years and finding them on the cheap and everything like that uh, is really inspiring. They were completely right. Um, the Tim Truman art, if anything, is just fantastic with these first comics on Grimjack. Uh, John Ostrander again, you know, so it's it's cool to be rediscovering this stuff. There's things that I see in these books. Uh, that was serendipitous because I was about to mention this and I have an example, but then I see things like this. Uh, this has got to be after the turtles had come, had come out and you had geriatric Kung Fu gerbils and all these little, uh, wannabes, if you will, inspired, uh, they, they have their fans. People love them, but you see things like the time beavers and stuff, right? It comes a point where I'm just like, I don't know how far I want to go exploring in these. Now, these are all books I've heard of. I, I knew the premise for John Sable, per se. I have issue one in there. I just picked these up for a buck a piece. No, these were less than a dollar a piece. Excuse me. These were, I'm in the stack where they were a quarter a piece. I've already shown these for a uh, toy uh, show they had in there. My apologies. Let me get through them. But anyway, but the John Sable, I can totally get why Mike Grail has its fans with some of the stuff he's done. Picked up an odd issue of Dragon's Bane. Anyway, Nexus. Nexus. I had like a 30-issue run of Nexus. And I don't think I appreciated Nexus at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been a huge Steve Rude fan ever since I saw his uh, Mr. Miracle one-shot he did around 87 or 88 at DC. I thought his stuff was fantastic. And the more I would learn about Steve Rude, about his influences being Alex Toth. And if you read Nexus, one of the tricks to read a Nexus, he's very, Steve Rude is highly influenced by the 60s and early 70s, the era he grew up. And uh, Space Ghost and Hanna-Barbera cartoons and stuff are a huge influence on him. And I've caught myself reading a few issues of Nexus where all of a sudden Nexus is actually, in my mind, look like Space Ghost. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing, you know. This is some uh, this is some great advice. Uh, explore the beavers. I would like to say that I have uh, done studies on beavers over the years, um, at least going on four to five decades here, which means I'm getting old. But uh, many species of beavers, many regions that beavers live in, um, a lot of you know, done a lot of uh, done a lot of uh, biological studies, if I will. <laughs> X, XJ9 Jenny Wakeman I, I believe this is a new viewer uh, bo hashtag boycott DC Comics and Warner Brothers close your wallets and pirate those movies <laughs> then we have another new viewer here at least that I'm aware of uh, Kartiki Dewey I love comics since 1977 you got a year on me man you got a year on me All right. but anyway next is Steve Rude Mike Barron good stuff I'm just glad to find these. And every now and then, I have another stack here where I'll probably do this. But um, one of my things is that I totally get people. People are excited about comics. Good. Fine. You know, we, we can have talks and debates that mean absolutely nothing. People want to do what they want to do. But I sort of get a kick out of going out. And um, there'll be a hot book all of a sudden popping up for whatever reason online. And a lot of people start jumping on. Uh, eBay and things trying to find these books and they'll sell out at mycomics.com or wherever you buy back issues and they go to eBay. And I'm convinced that a lot of this hype is made by YouTubers who hype up the books and then they stick them on eBay. You know, I, I'm convinced. I'm not saying every time. I'm not yelling conspiracy, but I, I, I do know a channel or two that have done, has done that in the past. And one of them actually got busted. I saw there was a channel... I mean, we're going way back, like 2014, 2015, where somebody actually would watch this person's channel. He would hype up these books and tell people, I'm predicting what's going to be hot. And uh, what he was doing is he was selling on eBay. And in another town, he had a P.O. box where he did his business. And when the guy, this is back in the day when you could still send a, a money order to a seller on eBay before PayPal was really picking up. And he had mailed it. And it turns out he was local and he sat at the post office and saw the dude from the video walk into the post office box and he recorded him and stuff and he busted him. And that guy's channel went downhill. I 
didn't really follow that drama. I kind of came in after it happened uh, with people telling me what was going on. But anyway, this book took off, uh, depending on what circles of online activity you watch. And this is a uh, 112. And I've, I've already had these because they have Squadron Supreme uh, members in them. The Squadron Supreme is in these with new members and stuff, right? And uh, I'm a huge Squadron Supreme fan, a huge, huge crime syndicate fan. I reached a point in my comic book collecting where I got tired of hearing about the Justice League and the Avengers going at it. I want to see Squadron Supreme take on the crime syndicate. Uh, you, you can get too deep into the comics, man. But anyway, but this book took off because I think everybody was speculating that on the WandaVision show, the blonde that was on there was going to end up being Arcana. And this is her first appearance. She was the Zatanna uh, archetype, if you will, for the Squadron Supreme. You know, so I kind of laughed at that. Getting into the old toy comics. I don't know why. Sometimes you just got to have fun and you just got to go with it. Some, but there's some Silverhawks for you. Another Nexus. I've had that one. That's my Nexus stack I was adding on there. Okay, we'll answer a question here. What we got here? Oh, Jenny here, Wakeman, is a robot superhero, guys. So appreciate your uh, dedication and your work. She also asked, what do you think of Doomsday Clock? Because there's a group of people, excuse me, who keep saying that uh, retcon Doomsday Clock. I think it's over and done with and we need to move on. Um, we have a Friday night show called uh, Cavern of Chaos where we talk about things. And Doomsday Clock was discussed by several of us. And uh, some of us came to the, we, we, we had different opinions on it. But what we agreed on was the fact that Gary Frank was doing solid work. It was, people were putting a lot of work into that book. A lot of things apparently were going on behind the scenes. And we felt really bad for people who were busting their ass for that, for a mediocre book. I don't think Doomsday Clock is relevant. Uh I don't think it's worth retconning. I think it's just time to move forward. <laughs> you know, so, you know. um, all the days of buying a money order and sending it via snail mail for your eBay hauls. You know, some, you know, the, you, the great thing about eBay in those days was that eBay really did have what I call yard sale prices. Okay. Uh, my brother turned me on. He let me use his account. My brother turned me on to eBay around 1998. And within just a couple months, I ended up getting the first five issues. Now, check this out. The first, This is how cheap it was back then. The first five issues of Jack Kirby's Mr. Miracle. Uh, Mr. Miracle. Rewind. In 1988, I was using my brother's eBay account. I'd go to his place and we'd play around on it. And uh, I, in, in three different auctions, I ended up getting the first five issues of... Uh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Miracle by Jack Kirby from the Fourth Fourth World series, right? Uh, you know, the first five issues in fantastic shape. I can go get them now, right? So in 1998, using the snail mail, mailing in the money orders, three different auctions, the total, now check this out, the total for all five books plus the shipping back then, $5. Yes. <laughs> it ended up coming out to a dollar a book. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. So that's where I was picking up a lot of really good stuff. Uh, eBay used to be fantastic. I remember seeing Shogun Warrior Godzilla figures with a old Frank Zilla. The, the, the one auction I cannot believe I walked away from that I regret to this day is that it was a Godzilla complete Shogun Warrior with the, you know, the tongue that came out and the hand that would shoot off with a great big, huge Frankenstein figure. And it was $3.50 on ebay back then yeah and it blows my mind that 19 1998 when this started is what 23 years ago and i feel like it was yesterday that's amazing that's amazing okay so some other books i got here we'll get through these i think these were a dollar to a dollar fifty to go through here man but uh another issue a floppy of strangers in paradise uh i've got to be close to having that entire series we had a show, The Cavern of Chaos. There were somebody in the comments mentioned Challengers of the Unknown because it was sort of on topic. And I had the miniseries and I went by, I got rid of the miniseries, but this is from 1991. And this is Challengers of the Unknown, Jeff Loeb's first comic book work. Uh, and one of the, I think it's the first series he did with Tim Sale. Uh, those guys would go on to do Hulk Gray. 
uh, Spider-Man Blue, Daredevil Yellow, Superman for All Seasons, Long Halloween, a lot of great Batman classic stuff. And that's cool. They took the challengers of the unknown, busted up the team. They all went their own ways to find their paths in life since they were living on borrowed time. And they ended up <laughs> turning into Marvel characters, a Punisher, a Doctor Strange. It was hilarious. Uh, what is your favorite Justice Society member? Um, hmm, Black Adam. But if I went classic, it would probably be the Golden Age Sandman, um, Dr. Midnight, one of those two guys. Uh, Legion of Superheroes number 50. Now, this is from Volume 3, the Baxter series. And this was a really interesting story. This was fantastic. This is a storyline. I know there's probably not a lot of Legion fans out there. But this was the storyline, uh, the ending of the storyline, where a couple members of the Legion decided to have their own little mission that they hid, they hid from the other mission, the other Legion members, where they're going to take down the Time Trapper. mon L ends up going after the Time Trapper, and this is supposed to be the issue where they have the epic battle and mon L disappears. It would be several years later in the Legion of Superheroes, five years later, that we found out what happened to mon L, if you will. Right. So this is actually a hard issue to find and it's not worth a lot of money. It's the kind of thing that the Legion fans who have it, they keep the damn book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but a uh, beautiful cover, great stuff. Fantastic. Uh, I think I need four or five issues to complete this Baxter series run. So yeah, we'll be working on that. Here is the book. Dr. Fate. Jenny likes Dr. Fate, and that's a great character. So this is the book that, for some reason, keeps disappearing from my Alpha Flight run. Yes, I said Alpha Flight. But this is the issue. This is the first one by Bill Mantlo, Mike Mignola. Now, what was going on is that Bill Mantlo and Mike Mignola was working on the Hulk book at the time. John Byrne was doing Alpha Flight, and then they just traded books. The creative teams create, just did books. And for some reason, this is probably my third or fourth copy. I have no explanation of why it keeps disappearing. You know, I had a beat up one forever. But this is probably my third or fourth time buying this. And I'll, I'll be holding on. And it is documented here on e, on YouTube that I have this. So I'm not going to be worrying about it. I always pick these up. The Mutant Massacre. This is part one of 86. This is what this was, this is the first time that you had, uh, that I can recall, where you had a an intricate multi-issue story running across the X-Men books. Uh, this was exciting at the time. This was fantastic at the time. What year was this? 86, 1986. I was 13 and I was right there. This was just as exciting to me as Crisis on Infinite Earths was, as Marvel uh, Superhero Secret Wars was when I was 11 and respectively 12 or 13. Uh, because nothing like this had been done at the time. It felt new. If it had been done, we're not talking about just two books crossing over. This was three, four, or five books all having something to do with, with the Mutant Massacre. Um, and I always pick these up when I run across them. The Mutant Massacre for X-Men fans at the time, and long-time X-Men fans, uh, after much discussion over the years, this is actually where it's like the X-Men fans feel like the series can be cut. You know, splice it right there. Because this is where the X-Men went off in a completely different direction. So it's like you have issue, what, it's great giant size X-Men number one, X-Men number, was it 94 guys? Help me out here. And then all the way up to about issue 210-ish. And then all of a sudden it's a whole new X-Men series. The X-Men have never been the same since. So this is a lot of, this was actually a jumping off point for people. And for some people, they just feel like that's where the X-Men books really changed. He got him. <laughs> uh, remembers nineties Doctor Fate, Jared Stevens. Oh God, it looks terrible. He got he got demonetized, monetized by YouTube. Oh, that's hilarious. All right, Predator to Cold War. It's blown my mind that there's some Predator hype and Alien hype. It's probably over by now. And for just a couple months, I've been finding some uh, early issues of Dark Horse Alien and Predator books. If they're cheap, I get them. And of course, you know, you put concrete on a book. Five years of excellence. You know, five, Dark Horse have been around for five years. But you put concrete on a book. You know, he's not in the book. Fill in a little New Mutants. And then I got a bunch of, uh, we won't go through all of these. But I'm filling in the gaps. Cable, it turns out, 
and it blows my mind, is a much better series than I remember. I had a few other books. But James Robinson came on the book, followed by a guy named Joe Casey. Uh, and But you had uh, Ladron come on there. And this is a guy that had Kirby-like characters with Jeff Darrow anime-like backgrounds and stuff, right? So I love this stuff. So I'm just splicing together, piecing together the missing issues I have of the Ladron run. Um, I'm a huge Ladron fan. I'm sure it's the Kirby in me that I love, but he's there. And then there's a book here called E-Man. Now, this was E-Man was interesting. It came out by Joe Statton and Martin Pascal in the 70s at Charlton. And then it would it came out in first comics uh, in the 80s, and it's been published here and there, a few other people. A bit of a cult book, at least it was. It's based a lot on uh, Einstein's E equals MC square. Alec Tron, the main character, is energy who has gained sentience in life, if you will. And it does a little bit of a parody of comics and stuff uh, inside of it, from what I can tell. But I remember, but the more that I remember about E Man is the fact that uh, the uncle and the stepdad would fight over whose E Man comics were theirs. This is like around 79 and 1980. So E Man books were always around. I'd flip through them, I never really got it. But what's interesting about this one um, in the first comics is one of the first things they do is they do uh, this take on the X Men because they were huge at the time, and he fights the F-Men. So, you know, it's fun comics that are funny, uh, being relevant to what the X-Men were at the time. Okay. Comic book G-Spot is out there. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Okay. Oh, let's take a break and let's look at uh, some movies, if you will. All right, I'm not going to show that one. So anyway, I went to went out a couple weekends ago looking for just kind of I had some errands to run. Hot off trash, had to go get worms for the bearded dragon, and some crickets for the bearded dragon, and I decided to look around. And with the quarantine that's been going on for the last couple, you know, the last year, it feels like more than a couple years, but this last year, flea markets, yard sales, all these things that I go to have been canceled and not going on, but I found two yard sales. One about nothing and one about some great stuff. These were $3 a piece, but I talked her down to just giving me four for 10 because I had a $10 bill in my pocket. I just didn't mention I also had four ones. But uh, anyway, I uh, ended up getting some Blu-rays of some Marvel movies, you know. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Of course, the digital codes are gone. Uh, Ant-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Guardians of the Galaxy and the first Captain America, the first Avenger. Those are my favorite Marvel movies. I mean, I really sometimes feel that's all I need. Uh, Iron Man 2. It's got Mickey or O'Rourke. I don't get into the uh, talks when people are like how bad this movie is. I think the bad Iron Man is Iron Man 3. I thought that was horrible. And then we have Logan. Uh, with the Fox movies, uh, love, love Logan, uh, a flawed movie at best, but at the same time, the, uh, the premise of the movie, the mood of the movie, so much they got right with this so much. They got right that the little flaws here and there are easily overlooked. I mean, you really have to nitpick, uh, to get that. And then these are the wives. She got some, uh, movies, uh, red, uh, based on a vertigo comic, if you will. Uh, great stuff. A bunch of uh, old uh, wet works ops who are retired. Red stands for retired and extremely dangerous, working with MC5 and doing their own thing. Morgan Freeman, John Malkovich. Uh, great movie. Second one, eh. Second one I could give or take. Uh, Narnia. Narnia is big in this house, along with the wardrobe. And then my wife likes the Hitman, Agent 47. So we have those. Now that's what's kind of funny in this house, man. I mean, like you see the stuff I have. She goes for the Hitman Agent Forty Seven, and I go for the Little Prince. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you have not read the French fairy tale for adults, uh, in my opinion, you need to actually read that Little Prince book, if you will. But uh, this, I was a little disappointed with in the theater when it came out because the little it wasn't the Little Prince movie. It had a whole framing story 
um in the real world and the little prince was probably in this like a total of like 10 minutes and then they do a sequel to what the little girl thinks the little prince is doing now um i walked out of the theater pretty pissed off but i rewatched it after i got it and i'm like i'm cool with it now i'm not expecting a little prince movie g-man for short all right so we got one little last before i get to the good stuff here what we got here okay one more ollie's trade here like i said I've, it's a big one uh the superman batman trade back in the early 2000s jeff Loeb, ed mcginnis started a superman batman book it was the symbols you would have the s over the batman symbol and basically they just didn't call it world's finest it was the return of world's finest okay they did some great stuff different arcs different artists came on but around issues, where's is it at? 14, 14 to about 17 or 18 has my absolute favorite Superman Batman story together uh, called Absolute Power. It has the Legion of Super Villains. It has Metron, Darkseid, the Demon all popping up, time traveling stories, a Gotham in a, in a realm of time, if you will, a time stream where all the uh, Western DC superheroes are in modern times. Jonah Hex pops up. Commandy pops up. But they're traveling through different time streams because the Legion of Super Villains uh, killed John and Martha Kent and took baby Cal el And then they came down and took Batman uh, when he was a kid. And uh, they decided to let them rule the world. They raised them to rule the world because they know the future. And then there's people who know that things are not as they need to be. Uncle Sam pops up. He is found by Diana, not called Wonder Woman. Diana, he's a bum in the subway station. And uh, she reminds him who he is. And he turns out to be Uncle Sam. And then he ends up getting a Green Lantern power ring. But the greatest thing about this, I'm going to spoil the ending. If you don't want to hear those endings spoiled, I'll put the book down when I'm done talking about it. But uh, the King Come Superman pops up and he, he made a little comment like, well, I got to go back again and try to fix things. And the King Come Superman gets involved in the story, if you will. But by the end of it, when time is finally fixed and it's exactly what it's supposed to be, we get a reference back to Alan Moore's Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And now in that book, Superman had lost his powers, grown a mustache. His name was Jordan, I think named himself after Jor-El. He hit it in there. Jordan Elliott. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, he lived happily ever after in the suburbs with Lois raising the kid. And the kid may be the new Superman because they showed him crushing a piece of coal into a diamond at the end of it. So the kingdom comes Superman is sitting there at the very last page of the story. And he lands in the suburbs. He starts walking away. He kind of talks to the reader and he turns in from that dark, future of kingdom come Superman into Jordan Elliott. And he shuts the door just like they did in uh, Alan Moore's final story. Whatever happened to the man of tomorrow from 85, 86. So that's why I love that story. It, 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 I love kingdom come and everything like that, but it gave us that silver age ending again. Fantastic. You didn't see it coming. Book is down. Spoil is over. Everybody, I, I lose viewers when I tell that story. It's amazing. Okay. If you watch Cavern of Chaos, you know why I picked up a Shadowline Saga book. It's hilarious. And uh, I'm doing this thing where DP7, the new universe, I'm just going ahead and completing the new universe as I go across these. I found these also for $3.15, a bunch of DP7 books uh, from the new universe. Uh, a Justice book that I found for a buck. I got all these for a dollar a piece. Again, uh, one more DP7 book. I had the first two issues of these when they came out, but they disappeared from the newsstand. But the uh, 80s Black Panther miniseries, where we get thinly veiled heroes, another Superman archetype. Always loved that cover. Dennis Cohen is on this. Got those. These were actually a dollar. These were three dollars for all four of these. And I hear that this book was hot for a while. I picked it up just to be funny. But uh, this is the new Avengers number thirty nine. Has Echo on the cover. That's not Psylocke. It's Echo. Uh, I don't care that somebody took a grease pen and put twenty five cents or a marker. But I got uh, another issue of my for my Invaders run. I was whittling those down. 
when with Thor pops up, but he won't remember being there in the on Earth in the 40s. Marvel Superheroes number three. I still have my comics that I bought off the rack, but this one supposedly is hot because they announced the She-Hulk show and Titania is supposed to be in it. And Titania, this is her first appearance, even though this is a uh, this is a uh, direct market cover. I got it for a buck. Oh, more DP7. Well, I'll spare you guys from that. But now we're going to get to the good stuff. We're going to end the show on my favorite book, my pick of the week. And hopefully I can remember what I had to say about it after an hour on here showing stuff. But it's Monsters. Thanks to the guys on the Cavern of Chaos show. Thanks to other YouTubers and things. I sort of might have a better and a whole the story behind the book sort of comes together now. But uh, this is the book where I'm going to be doing a proper video. I hope everybody kind of checks it out because I'm trying some different stuff. And I'll do comments before we go out there, right? But uh, Barry Winsler Smith and Monsters came out from Fantagraphics. This is actually a great price for 365 pages of art, one big story. And I'm only 50 pages into it because that's actually, it's that damn good. I was lucky to stop where I did. But uh, Barry Winsler Smith is going to be about 71 or 72. And he's been doing comics proper since about the late late 60s. Uh, having to ape Kirby because that's what, what was expected. And he got big with Conan. And I sort of found him in Epic Illustrated, uh, the Con son of the Conan that was around there, but I didn't know his name. I was just a kid. Um, and uh, every now and then he'd do an issue of the X-Men, Life, Death, Life, Death 2, Wolverine story. I see some covers. Um, so I've been aware of Barry Winsler Smith for quite a while. It was in the 90s where I probably became a hardcore fan where he was at Valley and everything. So the guy's been around for a while. But the idea, I, I've heard bits and pieces of Barry Winsler Smith working on a book. Um, for years, he had pitched a Hulk story in the 80s. Turns out it was 84 and 85. That's how far back this goes. I would hear Barry Winsler Smith in the 90s trying to get something going at Vertigo, and they turned them down. And this is it. I'm just giving you the these little stories that I had no idea it was the same project. And then I swear somewhere on social media, or maybe it was in a Wizard magazine or something, I remember a blurb of Neil Gaiman saying that he had seen this, this book that uh, he claimed Barry Winsler Smith had been working on for 20 years. And he's got to see somebody said it was fantastic. I had no idea they were all the same book. So this guy that is 71, 72 years old, this has taken about half of his life. I don't know how he worked on it. I don't know when he worked on it, but apparently this started out as a Hulk story and it's morphed into something that is probably better than anything that could have been released through Vertigo or through anything. And it's just fantastic. Uh, it's inspiring. It's about people. It He's found ways. My, my favorite part so far is how he interacts with the reader and you don't even realize it. It's like, I, it's like I'm examining the craft of a comic when I look at this. And Barry Winsler Smith is genius in this. There is a scene in 1964 where a guy named McFarlane goes down into his basement and he pulls out all these golden age comic books. He collected them in, as a kid in the 40s. And we're seeing Wiz comics and Batman comics, you know, Captain America comics, golden age comics. And then he reads them. Barry Winsler Smith knows exactly who his audience is and how to get an emotional reaction out of them. Because I freaked out for a minute. The pacing of this is it's it's flowing like one big story. The artwork is some of the best cross-hatching, mood, detailed line work I've ever seen. And that's not an exaggeration, what I've gone through before. And the pacing of it is that he does not give a shit. You know what I mean? He is telling the story. This thing flows beautifully. If there's a flaw in this book, it's where I couldn't find a place to stop. You, This book is just gripping. I find it very fascinating that we are, and I said this last night on the show, what I'm noticing is that we're in an era of uh, dead stories are being published and coming back, which is great because a lot of us older readers were told for years, these books aren't for you. 
And now us older readers are getting to get a hold of books of stories that we've heard about or didn't hear about, but we find out where they came from. The books I'm talking about, uh, Last Ronin, uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle book, uh, that is a leftover plot from the 80s that they're developing now. That was made by Eastman and Laird, uh, you know, their idea for the story. We got the... Uh, Next month, we have Alex Raymond. We have Dave Sim with the mysterious death or strange death of Alex Raymond uh, coming out. It's not coming out next month, but you can pre-order it this month. and It'll be out in two months. And then we got this monster book. And I'm sure there's another book or two out there that I could not believe. Um, I did not pay $40 for my book, uh, even though I've got some pricey stuff last month and this month, I still do the hustle on it. Uh, you can find, there's fine, there's ways out there you can get a discount on it. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, this was, this had a discount on it from Amazon right off the bat, right off the bat. It had a big discount on it. Something like 20, 25%. Uh, that was a couple weeks ago though. <coughs> uh, I don't know what it is now and stuff. Uh, somebody was asking how much the monster book was. Sorry guys. But anyway, it's just that to have that come out, uh, to see, in my opinion, comp a bunch of, and I'll be saying this stuff in the video I make proper of monsters. It's the first time in quite a while I actually want to do a whole video on one book. But uh, it, it's so cool to see monsters. I'm just going to hold that up again because just looking at it. Anyway, you know, you know this book, uh, I grew up in a time where I feel like comics got their validation through, you know, Alan Moore, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit of comics now. Uh Alan Moore, Watchmen, Dark Knight, you, you know the books, you know the validation. People say they grew up, people say they lost their innocence and stuff, but they got a validation where, you know, people kind of look down on comics. The stigma is still there. People who worked in comics in the 60s and 50s and stuff would lie about working in comics. And I can go on and on. And then all of a sudden, the way things have gone over the last couple of years, you've really got to dig to find those books that are just, you know, high quality let's put it that way so you turn around and you get this and it's like validation has returned to this stigmatized art form of the 20th century you know so it's so good to see something that you can give somebody hold it up to them and uh throw at them and you know they'd probably get enthralled but like i said this book is about people that's what's amazing the monster as jared osborne said last night is a minor character he's read further into it so, uh, yeah, it's kind of good to find something that's inspiring, something that you get absorbed into and escape into, something that gets an emotional response out of you, uh, something that I can sit here and just talk and talk and talk. And what's amazing is that over the last week, uh, I've seen shows, Comic Crack Show with uh, Sleep Reader and La Rasa. Uh, they had, uh, oh man, Earl Grey on there. Uh, I've seen a lot of people grabbing this book and having that same feeling of this is a masterpiece. We have a masterpiece in our hand and they know it. I've seen people rejuvenated and being very positive and bright in their videos again. You know, it doesn't matter what you say, but comic books do. When you do YouTube, in my opinion, you're a bit reactionary. You know what I mean? You get as juiced up as the last book you read. You know, okay, and it's just this to me. This this is a, one of those books that's going to be a standard on what you should be doing in, in comics, in my opinion, and what can be done. What do we got here? Oh, think well. Let me see here. We'll get to this. Okay, comic book. Geez, comic book spot. He gave five dollars super chat. Thank you, brother. Nice for the monster books. Yes, and this is a golden age for collecting, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Uh, William Bird ordering from Amazon is like playing Russian roulette as far as getting in good condition. Uh, there's a ding on mine. So yeah, I know what you're saying. But I've had good experience. I've had better experience with uh, Amazon in the last two or three years than I have with eBay, I will say that. And let me tell you, man, I stayed away from Amazon for a long time. I will say it has gotten better in my experience so far. So I'm with you on that. But Russian roulette, that's a perfect way to say it. Me and my boyfriend, Brad Carbuckle, watched the first three episodes of Jupiter's Legacy. It's pretty good. It had a few flaws, but overall, Netflix did a good job so far. We have to watch the rest. Nice. I'm hearing mixed things about Jupiter's Legacy. 
I've heard people dip out after the first episode. I don't know how many episodes. I mean, I know Netflix drops them all, but people are having to tell people to stick in there. It gets better. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. One of the things that I've watched is the Invincible cartoon on Amazon. And I was really surprised. It's really odd. Invincible and Daredevil. Daredevil. Invincible and Deadpool in the comic books, I just can't get on board with. But... I love the Deadpool movies and the Invincible cartoon was fantastic. You know, I mean, it's just, I just couldn't handle the comics of those, if you will. You know, uh, there's a lot about the Invincible book. I, I could, the Invincible, you know, when I picked up the book and read it, I was like, Invincible is Peter Parker. His dad is Superman with a bad porn stash. I couldn't get past that. And it's a lot of the aesthetics. I really didn't enjoy a lot of the bright, bold colors that they were doing with the designs of the costume and trying to mix it in with real life violence and stuff. Um, I just felt like it was derivative of Marvel and DC books. And he was just trying to do a little, you know, twist, put a little twist on, on the comics. Uh, it doesn't mean it was bad. It's just, that's why I didn't collect it. And all of a sudden I see this animated feature. The pacing of the stories is different. They've had, you know, there's, it's like they've tweaked things a little bit from what I remember and it's a great cartoon. I really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, it's, it's been renewed for season two and three. So that's fantastic. All right. Thank you again there. Comic book G spot. So we have been on here for an hour and five minutes. Thanks for the people that stuck around. Thanks for the people that came in and out. Thanks for comic book, uh, the spot there. Uh, for doing that. Thank for everybody that's gotten in the chat. Thanks to everybody who uh, helped me remember movies and comics and we do the work together and we do all this stuff. But now it's time to put this together, find my real hat and maybe get out and uh, try to enjoy this sunny day that finally has popped up. So like, sub, subscribe, let people know we're here and you guys be excellent to each other and have a great weekend. Later guys.